Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Dev Talk today. We're a couple minutes before the hour upon start. And so we're just going to put you all on hold for a minute here and wait for everybody to join, and then we'll get it underway. Thanks again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Dev Talk. Uh, we're going to learn about what's new for Andro for Zebra developers with Android Pi today. But before we start off with Darren Campbell as our expert um, presenter, we're going to talk a little bit about our last push and notification on Zebra's app forum um, happening in the Americas in Las Vegas, October 1st and 2nd. Registration is still open, soon to close in about a week or two. And we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. We have um, quite an interesting um, group coming. We have a lot of sessions for developers, a lot of deep dives um, and meeting a lot of those experts um, on location. And we encourage everybody to join us. Um, we're gonna also have some thought leadership sessions as well to see the direction of new technologies and and some happenings at Zebra Technologies itself. So we hope that all of you can join us um, and we encourage you to register for that today. Uh, for today's session, uh, Darren, as I said, will be our speaker and presenter. Um, we're gonna hold all of the questions until the end and you can go ahead and type those into the question box on your screen um, and I'll read those off towards the end. Um, if you haven't already joined our Zebra developer community, we encourage you to do so, where you can see um, copies of all of these dev talks and information related to developing uh, for Zebra Technologies devices and solutions. Um, that would be at developer.zebra.com. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Darren and we'll kick off today's dev talk. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, Stacey. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thanks. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks for the uh, the app forum introduction. I'm I'm going to be there. It should be a, a good event. So hopefully I can see many of you here who are on the call today. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of the latest additions in Android Pie that are most interesting and relevant to enterprise developers targeting Zebra devices. Um, as you may or may not have noticed, we have started to roll out Pie builds for our non WAN devices so the the non-cellular devices and the cellular devices will be getting those updates very shortly it's just they have to go through another round of um, whatever it's called testing and uh, when carrier certification etc but uh, yeah we're, we're starting to roll them out so this is a very relevant uh, topic obviously we planned uh, everything to align uh, honestly uh, so i don't want to uh, give the impression that there's anything really new in pi which is changing fundamentally how developers need to target writing their applications uh, for our devices. This is a slide which I kind of update every year. I've been doing this presentation for a few years now, it's since at least Marshmallow. And uh, the, the main 
the main things which enterprise developers need to be aware of or tend to affect them are having applications run in the background. So Android's always trying to do different things over the years to stop your applications running in the background, be it those mode, background restrictions, and we're going to be going over some of the additional restrictions which have been introduced in Pi. These are all cumulative, I should stress. So um, all of the information I present here builds on top of what came previously with Oreo and NuGet, etc. Uh, there always tends to be a difference in how the notifications work on Android, so we'll go over that. There's one or two major changes which affect enterprise. The major change this release, uh, which I seem to get the most questions about, are the uh, the ability to call non-SDK methods, the restricted methods, and we'll just go over the whitelist and graylist and blacklist. And uh, obviously we've got Android 10 on the horizon. We've started looking at that. So I'm sure I'll be uh, on this call next year talking about uh, Android 10, but let's just dive into Pi. This is not, uh, well, everything I'm saying here so it does not replace any of the advice which Google give. Google have some really great documentation that they put out for each version of Android that they release and the links are all here. They also have some really great blogs so I encourage you to check those out to really understand the fundamentals of the Android operating system. Because although we build on top of it with our MX layer and our additional functionality, we're not rewriting any of the core Android stuff. You know, if there's an Android API, then you're going to be using that Android API. Um, I also have publish every year a, a document essentially summarizing everything which I'm going to be going through on this call. The, the things to be aware of in the different versions. And I recently published my version on Pi. In fact, I think I've got a, yeah, I put a, a screenshot in there. So if you uh, want like maybe a deeper dive into anything which I'm going into today, then check out the developer.zebra.com. I think it's still on the carousel that we've got of the latest posts, or if not, then just type uh, what's new in Android Pi into the search field and uh, you'll get my post come up. But uh, with all of that out of the way and said and done, uh, I always start off by saying that Google's highlighted features that if you go to the developer.android.com, they'll say that these are the most important changes in Pi, and they'll talk about multi-camera APIs and display cutout APIs. These don't tend to be relevant to uh, Zebra developers necessarily, especially not the display cutout APIs. We don't have any plans for a display cutout device, um, unless people aren't telling me something which is uh, more than possible. Uh, but like I say, the most interesting aspects for enterprise devs tend to be running in the background. So I've got a few slides now. I'm just going to be talking over what has changed in Android Pi. There are three, or I would classify it as three. Uh, some people would say it's two, but you know, there's two or three new features or restrictions on what an application can do in the background. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is the uh, app standby buckets. Now, this is uh, an enhancement to a previous feature called App Standby that was introduced in Android Marshmallow. But now we have a notion that an application can exist in a particular bucket. And depending on which bucket you're in, it affects what your application is able to do when it's in the background. So the, the next slide is a table of what those buckets are. But just before we dive into that, just understand that there's no API to request that you be put in a particular bucket. There's no callback to say when your bucket that you're in changes. And uh, there's there's no way really for you as an application to influence what bucket you're put in. So the best advice is to, where possible, work within these bucket restrictions which Android has introduced in Pi. And uh, the buckets are as follows. So an active, when, when you are assigned to the active bucket, you have no restrictions. You are in the foreground at this point. So a background app won't find itself in the active bucket. If you're in the working set, then this is essentially how you worked under Oreo. So as you know, we said last year, if you're using the jobs or the alarms API, they're going to be deferred to that maintenance window that was first introduced in Doze mode. And there's there's no restrictions, though, on network access or the ability to receive high priority Firebase cloud messaging. The concerning, and I use that in inverted commas, uh, changes are the new frequent and rare buckets. So if your application finds itself in one of these buckets, then there are additional restrictions. Like I know a lot of our customers are now starting to embrace uh, having their devices have access to the internet. They're starting to embrace GMS, and as such, they more and more using Firebase cloud messaging as the de facto standard for delivering asynchronous messages. Well, 
all of a sudden this is limited to only delivering 10 or five high priority messages a day. And it's important that those are high priority because it's only that level of priority which enables the notification to be received even if the device is in doze mode. Uh, and so like, uh, what can you do about this? Well, luckily, uh, fortunately, we have already done a lot of this work. So understand that uh, like, if you read through the documentation, then applications which are on the doze mode whitelist are exempted from bucket-based restrictions. So it's not immediately clear how all of these like restrictions tie into each other. So just to reiterate, if you're not aware, Doze Mode was first introduced in Android Marshmallow and Android Nougat. It, pre it uh, prevented applications from accessing the network. It introduced a mode called Doze Mode where when you left the device stationary and, and off of power, so running on battery, then applications could only do background tasks during a maintenance window. And for a lot of our customers, this was an issue because uh, they wanted to have long running applications in the background. And I've done previous dev talks and blog posts about this. Uh, so we introduced a new feature to our MX layer, uh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so we have the app manager, which enables you to whitelist an application. So when your application is whitelisted, it is not subject to doze mode restrictions. And the terminology gets a little bit confusing, but by quote, removing your application from battery optimization per the screenshot here, the, uh, the, the application is on the whitelist, it is whitelisted. You can also disable doze mode entirely on the device using the MX Power Manager. And this can be done either by an application on the device or through our StageNow to tool or through OEM config um, feature coming when supported by EMMs. But I wouldn't recommend disabling it entirely on the device because that would increase your battery consumption. But the key point is, if you are already whitelisting your application, then you are already exempt from these bucket-based restrictions. You will always be uh, having the same behavior as you had uh, previously in uh, Marshmallow and, and, and Oreo. So if your application works today in Oreo, it will continue to work in P if you're whitelisted with these buckets. Uh, so there are some ADB commands for testing. There's uh, the command to put your application in a particular bucket or to retrieve what bucket your application is in, or through the developer options as a screenshot on the right-hand side here. If you go to standby apps, uh, under developer options, standby apps, it will tell you which bucket each application is in. And notice how the calendar here is exempted. So if you had whitelisted your application against Doze mode, it would be exempted just like the calendar app in the screenshot here. So that was bucket restrictions. The second uh, type of background restriction, which is new in Pi is, and forgive the terminology here, that the, the best description I can see online is they call it app restriction. So it's not very descriptive, um, but just understand that there is a restricted state that the application can be in. And when it's in this restricted state, then jobs or alarms won't fire uh, in the background. It will have no access to the network or device location at all, regardless of what permissions have been granted to the application. And it is at no point in the background able to receive a Firebase Cloud message, regardless of whether that's a high priority or a low priority message. Uh, so it's a much stricter implementation of Oreo's background limits. If your enterprise app finds itself in this restricted state, it's more than likely, uh, if you want to do any kind of work in the background, it's more than likely that your app is no longer essentially functional for, for your line of business needs at this point. Uh, so let's first of all understand in a little bit more detail. So it's it's put an application is put into the restricted state in a couple of ways. So on the left hand side here, uh, in the settings battery window, if the application is determined to be misbehaving by Android, and it's not entirely clear if you read through the documentation what a misbehaving app would be. I think the quote is something like has excessive battery usage and weight clocks. And so I, I don't like the fuzzy explanation there. So I thought, aha, I will write my own application. I will understand this a lot better and I will write a, a blog post and it will go viral and I'll get all these likes on social media, whatever. I wanted to understand it a bit more. I tried to write an app. It was using battery in the background. It had lots of weight clocks and I was not able to get Android to determine that my application was misbehaving. So I don't know what I was doing wrong. Honestly, I personally, I found that 
before it was determined to be misbehaving, it was being subject to other restrictions. For example, I was trying to do a lot of work in a background service. Well, I can't have a long running background service on Oreo, uh, from Oreo onwards. And so all those kind of restrictions that are already in place stop me from writing a misbehaving app. But it is possible, obviously, this screenshot, I ended up Googling like what are misbehaving apps and I got this uh, phone, my phone explorer. It's just something I downloaded just to get this screenshot. Um, on the right hand side, the user can choose to manually put the application into the restricted state by uh, going into the application info and then battery usage and then clicking on background restriction. And after they enable that, then in Chrome in this case or whatever app they've chosen to access the settings of would be considered restricted. Uh, so the takeaway though from this slide is that either Android have notified me that the app is using excessive uh, power, do I want to manually restrict it, or I have taken the decision as a user to manually restrict the application. So both of these were manual steps taken by the end user, and so as we get on in the slides, I think I'll, I'll go through the, the ways of doing it, but it's something we really want to prevent the user from doing. Now, there is another way as like if you want to see the list of restricted applications on the device just to make you aware you can go settings battery adaptive battery and you click on the restricted apps and then you'll get a list of, of which applications have already been restricted so google will recommend working with background restrictions where necessary uh, in your application rather than trying to counteract it but in all honestly honesty most line of business apps that want to do any work in the background just will never want to find themselves in a restricted state and the best way to avoid that is to limit the user's ability to access the settings and to therefore you know, manually put the application into a restricted state so I've, I've listed like four different ways that you can do that zebra have their own enterprise home screen application it replaces the device launcher and uh, provides you with, uh, it, it locks the user out of, of all of the settings or uh, you know, only presents partial settings to the user so that they're not able to do things like restrict applications. We uh, actually related to that, the EMM that you're using, like if you're using Sotio or Airwatch, then they will almost certainly have their own launcher that they recommend to lock down the device as well, doing a very similar function to enterprise home screen, just replacing your default launcher. We do have uh, in the Zebra MX Access Manager a whole slew of features restricting, uh, they call it the whitelist, and you can specify restricted settings. And if you do that, then only a very few uh, settings like uh, about and display uh, brightness will be given to the user if, if they're restricted, these settings. Uh, but as we go into Android Enterprise, as this becomes more more uh, ubiquitous uh, amongst our customers then you might choose to take to make use of lock task mode and some of the kiosk features which android have introduced in android enterprise which again have a very similar functionality they're locking out what the user can do they're preventing them from running apps and preventing them from accessing the settings so there's many ways to do this but the takeaway is somehow prevent your app your user from um, manually restricting your apps so I said there were three, uh, I would classify them as three. This one's maybe a little bit, uh, not necessarily a, a, a new restriction in Pi, but I wanted to highlight that there have been some changes to the way that Battery Saver works. So if you're not aware, Battery Saver has been a part of Android ever since, ever since I can remember, and I've been working on Android since Gingerbread, is the ability for the user to uh, specify a level of battery at which the device will go into battery saver automatically, or you can also uh, manually turn on battery saver. And in this state, all applications will be considered to be in that the restricted state that I was describing just now. It's, it's the same. You know, they can't do any work in the background. Really, they have no access to the network. They can't receive Firebase cloud messages, and they can't uh, run jobs or alarms or anything like that. You have to be in the foreground to do any work. What has changed though, and I've got the, the differences between Oreo and Pi on this, uh, this slide here. So out of box, no change. There's no, um, it's, it's off. If you're not turning it on, and if the user's not turning it on, then you don't have to worry about this in Pi. Um, 
you can manually enable it using the quick settings icon. So by dragging down from the notification shade with two fingers or by dragging down twice with the same finger, uh, you can access the, the quick settings and you can uh, turn battery saver on here. Again, no change between Aria and Pi. That's another thing that you can lock down with enterprise home screen or uh, lock task mode, anything that I said on the previous slide. The changes though come in that on Pi, you can now configure the uh, the, the battery to be a lot higher before it goes into battery saver mode. So I can say when the battery reaches 75% of, of amount of charge, then enter battery saver mode. So it's, it's possible to enter battery saver a lot earlier on a Pi device, but most impactful, I think, is once it's in battery saver mode, the only way to exit battery saver mode on Pi is to uh, some kind of manual intervention. So either by exiting it manually or uh, with the quick settings icon or going into the settings screen. Now contrast that with Oreo, where as soon as you apply power to the device, uh, the battery saver mode was exited automatically. And then when I removed that power, it remained out of battery saver mode. So just bear that in mind. You Again, you probably don't want to be having your devices go into battery saver mode. Obviously, Zebra devices have removable batteries. They're designed to last for a whole shift or have hot swappable batteries so you would probably put a new battery on and continue working to the device's full capability rather than eke out that last few percent of the battery with battery saver mode and applications being uh, essentially non-functional. Well I've gone on about battery saver mode enough. Um, this, this list summary changes um, compared with Marshmallow and compared with Oreo there's been a lot fewer real impacts I think in how uh, background background behavior works in Pi. So there are changes which are user user initiated changes like I went over with application restrictions or there were those bucket based restrictions. But I think a lot of customers who were already impacted by Doze mode would have whitelisted apps if, and, if, and if there's a very strong overlap between customers impacted by those and customers that would be impacted by these app standby buckets, then if you're using that whitelist capability, then you're not going to be affected anyway. Um, so hopefully the uh, takeaway here is that the deployment changes would be minimal. If you want to go into more detail about any of these uh, these changes, and I know some of our customers really want to <laughs> go into the, the nitty gritty and the, in, in the individual source code, I would recommend a great presentation from Google. It's getting onto a year old now, but it's still got some great content. And obviously Pi itself is getting onto a, a year old now, as is the nature of Android. Uh, so from Google's Android Dev Summit back in November 2018, these are actually some screenshots from that presentation. So they'll go through how each of the individual APIs work in the different modes. You see alarm manager there, you see scheduled jobs. And I think they, they tease about the uh, work, um, oh, what's it called? There's, there's a, a new API, uh, it will come to me later on, but the, the API which takes all of this work away from you. I've got it on a subsequent slide, My it's uh, escape my mind. I do apologize, but we'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so that is essentially the end of the first part of the presentation. That's all the background stuff. It can be a little bit duller, so hopefully uh, we've, we've got the important but duller stuff out of the way, and we'll go into some of the new features which Android have introduced in Android Pi. Uh, so there has been some enhancements to lock task mode and the ability to lock down the device. Now, lock task mode was introduced in Android Marshmallow and it had like minor improvements in Nougat and Oreo. And this was the ability for a an application to be a kiosk application or for the uh, administrator with working with the developers to choose a number of applications which would all be the kiosk application. You'd have to have some way of switching between these applications. But the the in the old way, you know, before Pi, an application had to know that it would be uh, a, a, in the it be a kiosk app. It had to initiate like set lock task when it had to call that API from the app itself. In Pi, it's possible for the EMM or the device owner it has to be in device owner mode to put any application in lock task mode. So what this means to you as a developer is now you may find yourself if you're running on a Pi device as the kiosk app. And in this lock task mode scenario, you need to be whitelisted in order to run. So if your application has dependencies, like let's say you are using Chrome to, you know, the actual Chrome application, you're sending an intent with a, a, a geo 
uh, not a geo, uh, a URI encoded data data URI. And so that's obviously launching the Chrome application to browse to the URL and you get back to your app by pressing the back key. Uh, if you're in this, uh, this lock task mode, then you might have a problem with that because Chrome might not be whitelisted. And the same with maps as well. Another very popular scenario where you just send an intent with the geo, uh, geo URI, it's data scheme, I think it's called. I apologize, the, the, I'm getting on a bit. Uh, so the uh, if Maps is not whitelisted, then Maps is not going to launch. So you need to be uh, working maybe with the administrator or make this very clear in your release notes of your application if you're part of an ISV that you have these dependencies that you need to make sure get whitelisted if your administrator is using lock task mode. Uh, and if you are such an administrator, there's been some new flags added in Android Pi to configure what lock task mode looks like. And I've just very quickly, I'll go over what those flags do. So just to be clear, in these examples, we're setting the calculator app as the kiosk mode. So by default, uh, if I get my mouse here, so if you pass in none, it's the default behavior, you see there are no, um, uh, there's no home screen, there's no uh, recents button. You can pass in system info, and if you do that, then you'll get a clock as part of your lock task mode when you're in when you're in this mode, and you'll get the Wi-Fi and battery indicator. There's no way at the moment to get one or the other. I was at a Google conference, uh, and that was one question that was asked to the Android Enterprise team, and they said, "Oh, that sounds like a good feature. Let us think about that." But obviously, I haven't seen anything in queue, so it's it's only possible to have both of these shown at the same time. Uh, there's the home flag, and you can. Obviously, they're flags. We all know how flags work, so you can uh, you can combine these, but I've just done them separately here. Uh, so you can have the home button shown. If you press that home button, then normally the launcher launches, obviously, clues in the name. Um, however, I, what I said earlier about having that whitelist, you need to make sure that the launcher is on the whitelist. And typically, uh, that wouldn't be a developer's responsibility. That would be the responsibility of the administrator, but I'm trying to present a, a whole world view of, of how this all fits together. Uh, and then once you're in the launcher, uh, applications will only launch if they are whitelisted. So obviously I'm running the calculator right now. If I clicked on the home screen and the launcher is whitelisted, then the launcher will be shown. If I then clicked on the Chrome icon, then Chrome, it would do a little animation, but it would only launch if the Chrome app package, com.android.com, Chrome uh, is is on the whitelist, so uh, so yeah, just just be aware of that. Lock task feature notifications. So this is the ability to drag down the notification bar. I'm and can't remember off the top of my head if that also affects quick settings. So um, yeah, okay, but it definitely does show notifications in this mode. Oh no, I've I've got in my notes of the slide here the quick settings panel remains disabled. Okay, thank you, past Darren. Uh, next flags, and there's only one more after this. Key guard. So if you've set a pin or password on the device, then put the device into lock task mode. That device will not show the pin pad. Um, this is obviously designed more for a, maybe a kiosk scenario uh, where you wouldn't necessarily have a pin pad. But if you want that pin to show, then you need to pass the lock task feature key guard flag into the, the call to lock task mode. Uh, and then penultimate flag here, if you pass this overview flag in, you must also pass in the home flag at the same time, but that gives you access to the recent button uh, on the right there. And there are some global actions. I didn't know this was called global actions till I read through the documentation for this, but this thing here, when you press and hold the power key, this will be shown if and only if you've specified global actions when in lock task mode. Uh, so the, the real takeaway from, from this is there's a lot of overlap between, and I won't go through all of these, but these are MX features that we already have in the product. We have the ability to enable or disable the recent button. We have the ability to enable or disable the home button and all of these on the, the second version of this slide here. Um, we are continuing to evaluate how popular the, uh, the Android enterprise version of these features are. Uh, obviously, we don't want to duplicate functionality, but we don't want to take away useful functionality from our users. So we are continuing to look into the fact that we're duplicating functionality here, but we don't yet have any plans to 
remove it, but I can't say what will happen in um, a couple of years time, but just uh, something to be aware of more than anything. And obviously it will depend on adoption within the community. Okay, so that was locked task mode. The next feature I want to talk through is ephemeral users. Now, ephemeral users were introduced in Android as a way to address the multi-user use case. Uh, so in terms of enterprise, it's the, the worker coming onto their shift and they have a rack of devices and they want to take a device from that rack and sign in somehow using some authentication mechanism and the app will be automatically provisioned with the applications, the settings and the configuration needed for that worker to do their job. And obviously the worker may change, it might be a manager, it might be a, a line worker, it might be someone who's going out and doing deliveries, these might all share the same devices, how do we provision the devices appropriately? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so Android's way of addressing this, and we've seen many customers have addressed this with with uh, uniquely created uh, software solutions, has uh, been to introduce a new feature called ephemeral users. So this this takes uses the existing Android multi-user capability. So you have the notion of primary users and secondary users already in Android. We've had that since uh, Froyo or Gingerbread or whenever, but now. Uh, how ephemeral users work is if the device is in device owner mode, so it has an EMM, an enterprise mobility manager, I think they're going to call them UEMs coming soon, but whatever, so to yeah, watch uh, mobile line, one of those, and uh, they're running as device owner mode on the device, that EMM, if it's chosen to implement this functionality, because this is something which Android is exposed as something the EMM can do, um, but if the device is in device owner mode, the EMM can choose to create an ephemeral user and then the EMM controls that user in profile owner mode. So uh, the, the point of me sort of going through all this here is we're, we, Zebra, fully support ephemeral users. You know, it's part of standard Android and we obviously support Android. It will work on our devices, but there's a lot of work that needs to go on from the EMM side in order to make ephemeral users a useful and uh, usable solution for customers. So I, I haven't seen too much adoption. I think Google are looking to see what the interest is in ephemeral users, but we're always interested in, in interested in feedback on this product. So let us know if you've got any experience or desire or you know you want to influence what ephemeral users does and we can see where we go with the with the solution there. Um, the whole login and log out, like I say, that's that scenario where the worker comes online and they sign in with some authentication. That would need to be, all be done and accomplished via the EMM. So this is very much an EMM or I mean it's a set of APIs which Google have exposed, but it's APIs that need to be used and incorporated into the enterprise mobility management product. So that's ephemeral users. Uh, notifications, and uh, I think there's only a couple more feature slides. Notifications are have changed. And it's always easiest, I think, to show this change by having a side-by-side -side comparison. So on Oreo and Pi, a standard notification looks very similar, if not identical. I think it's just the resolution of the device I was taking the, the screenshot on there. If you long press that notification, then you have the, the same options, but they're presented differently. You have the ability to disable the channel and you can like stop notifications or you can access more settings in Oreo and that's the same as accomplished by the eye up here, or you can click done and that's the same as keep showing. Excuse me. So it looks different, but functionally it remains the same if you long press that notification. If you repeatedly dismiss a notification on Pi, then you get this additional pop-up in the bottom right hand corner here that says, hey, you usually dismiss these. Do you want to keep showing them or do you want to dismiss them? So this is something that a user would, would come across if they're constantly dismissing your notifications for your application. Uh, so what we have at the moment in uh, MX, so accessible through Zebra Stage Now, through OEM Config or through applications, uh, through the EMDK profile configuration is the ability to call the app notification control option. I didn't come up with the names, but this prevents the user from long pressing. No, it, it prevents the user from accessing the application settings. So if I go back to the previous slide, they can't, they can't click more settings and they can't click I. We are still looking at uh, an ability to disable the ability to 
have that to to disable the ability for the user to prevent notifications from showing with this. I don't know why I'm pointing on my screen. You can't see what I'm doing with my finger, can you? Um, so this one here, we're working on some way of, uh, of, of, of not have that dialogue come up. But in the meantime, uh, to work around that ability for the user to, to dismiss the notification, you can make the notification persistent, which is you can is like a if you call dot set ongoing when you're creating the notification, then the, the notification cannot be dismissed until your application decides that it can be dismissed. Uh, so they, they were the real big feature differences. There's a couple of minor privacy enhancements that have been added in Pi. Uh, so like changes to what happens with the background sensors when the application applications in the background, sorry, device sensors. So Google recommend using a foreground service. I know foreground services were very popular in Android Oreo as a way of working around those background limitations. So I imagine a lot of our customers are still using foreground services as they like, transition to more uh, accepted ways of, of working around these background restrictions. Uh, there's been some permission changes around phone numbers. Uh, incidentally, if you're using a uh, an EMM or if you're uh, installing your applications through Stage Now, then your the runtime permissions dialog that was introduced in Marshmallow won't be shown if, uh, I think it's an option in EMMs, but with Stage Now it just doesn't show automatically because you know th these are shared devices, the, the app developer, the administrator wants to have that control of accepting permissions rather than the end user. So when you see things in the release notes like now an application needs read phone state or now an application needs uh, additional permissions, it doesn't tend to be something that affects enterprise devices because they're using an EMM or stage now, et cetera. Uh, so getting towards the end, uh, restrictions on non-SDK interfaces. This is a, a big change. I'll probably do a, a separate blog post on this uh, actually when we start getting a bit more advanced in our device releases. The idea here, and this is a Google initiative to prevent applications from calling non-public SDK, so non-public APIs. This is either through Java, JNI, or Kotlin. Uh, and the way, obviously you, you can't just turn everything off uh, it, all in one big bang because that would impact too many developers and it, it would be, uh, you know, there'd be a backlash. Uh, so what Google are doing, they're introducing these different lists. Um, so if an application is on the whitelist, it's considered part of the public API, the public SDK, there's no problems using APIs on the whitelist. So you're, you're good to go, you're already to, to use those. If an API is on the blacklist, then Google say you cannot use that SDK, that API, sorry, and an error will appear when you run that, uh, that application on any Pi device. So these are restricted to APIs where there are definitely alternatives in the public space. You know, there are there are alternatives to blacklist APIs already on the whitelist whitelist list of APIs. You should not be calling blacklist APIs. The com the complication comes in in the gray lists. So for the light gray list, an API on the light gray list does not have a public alternative yet. Uh, so you'll get a warning if the target SDK is greater than P, uh, but if it's less than P, you won't get that warning. The API will continue to function. Google have determined that this you have like valid reasons to be calling this API, but you know, they haven't quite added that API to the whitelist yet. They'll get around to it, but for now, you're just going to get a warning if your target is greater than or equal to pi. On the dark gray list, then there is an API alternative on the whitelist that you could use, but it's only available on Android Pi or higher. So if your target SDK is less than Pi, you obviously can't use the whitelist alternative. And so the uh, you'll get a warning to say, hey, when you update your target SDK, you're gonna need to use the whitelist, um, but that's all you get. But when you do update your target SDK, then an error is thrown if it's Pi or higher because you should be using the API on the whitelist. Uh, just a little bit more information on, on these lists. So these lists come from Google. It is allowed through the uh, anti-fragmentation agreement or whatever other agreements we've signed with Google. We can add to these lists, but Zebra have not done so, and we have no plans to do so either. We don't want to complicate you, you guys' lives. Um, but 
OEMs, we, we cannot remove interfaces from these lists. So although we'd love to say, hey, there's this, there's this new feature, but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you know, we, we can't be CTS compliant if we remove any, everything from these lists. So the lists, we don't have much influence over. Uh, there is uh, a lot of documentation on Google's website. So have a look through their testing for non-SDK interfaces page. And also they go through a couple of techniques. You can either just run the device and look at the errors that come out in LogCat personally, that's what I would do. Uh, or if you're more of a fan of static analysis, there's this static analysis tool. I think it's developed, uh, sorry, delivered as a container and you can then you know, analyze your APKs. Uh, and obviously you want to have some kind of transition plan in place to move entirely to whitelist APIs as time progresses. So just to round up, a couple of, of minor features, indoor positioning with Wi-Fi RTT. So Zebra devices, all Android Pi devices, well, that's, that's not technically true. Zebra devices running Android Pi will support Wi-Fi RTT. You do need to have uh, your access points supporting AO211MC. So not all access points support this. I should say what this is, incidentally. Um, uh, Wi-Fi RTT stands for round trip time. It's a new feature which allows the uh, device to know the distance to an access point. It uses um, the same similar calculations to uh, you know, GPS satellites. It relies on the speed of light, the distance to the AP. You can work that out based on the amount of time it takes the signal to go to the AP and, and come back. If you have three of these APs, you can uh, you can calculate your position in a two-dimensional plane. And in theory, if you have four of these APs, you can calculate your position in a three-dimensional plane. We're continuing to, to look into this. This is a really interesting feature. I, I know we've had a lot of interest at, at the previous app forums that I've been to. I've started playing with this. So look out for more information and, and innovation from Zebra in this space as, uh, as time um, progresses. Uh, incidentally, if you do want to do any testing, then uh, I'm personally using a Google Wi-Fi access point. Well, you know, multiple ones of them to, to trilaterate my position. Uh, it seems to work. They don't uh, claim official support, but it, it works kind of well enough. I'm still learning. I've only been doing it for the past week. So yeah, it's very interesting and exciting. Um, but if you want to do any kind of indoor locationing very precisely, uh, if you speak to our sales engineers, then they would be very happy to go through all of the other location solutions, offerings that we have within Zebra. We have Bluetooth solutions, we have RFID solutions, we have our smart lens package, and we have also a partnership with Philips or I think they're Signify now for visible light communication that also works on our devices. So as far as indoor location is concerned, Google have you covered. No, ah, sorry, Zebra have you covered. Oh, goodness me. Oh, well. Who, who, we'll keep that as our secret, I said that. Um, okay, so neural networks, finally then, a uh, final feature. There is a uh, an API update in Pi. If you read through the Google Docs, it will talk about the neural networks API version 1.1. Just bear in mind, and I am grateful to uh, the, uh, our Zebra engineer, Rafael, I, I call him Rafal. Uh, he's done an external article on this and he's also done a, a webinar. The links are available in this slide. The takeaway is we're using the Snapdragon 660 chipset uh, and Qualcomm have introduced their own SDK. It's called the Snapdragon Neural Processing Engine or SNPE. So if you're reading about the Neural Networks API, that's not relevant to Zebra devices, but it definitely is possible to have machine learning. So definitely check out Rafael's article and Rafael's webinar for a lot more information and in-depth uh, on the subject. He certainly knows more than I do about uh, machine learning. Uh, so finally, uh, there's been changes to the Google Play Store, just like there were changes last year. What we're seeing is more customers using managed Android, and as such, more enterprises are using the managed Play Store to deliver their applications to those managed devices. Uh, now, as time goes on, I, well, this, this restriction, I should say, actually, is if you want your application to be in the public Play Store, then it needs to target API level 28, which is Android Pi, or higher. Every year this updates, so if in August 2020, they haven't officially announced this, but you know, kind of obviously the target API is going to update to probably level 29 or wherever we are at that point. But uh, these things change, you need to be targeting a recent 
API level. There's Google documentation that sort of goes over what the changes, how your application behavior will change when you update that target SDK. There's very, it gets very detailed actually, so have a, a look through there to understand that in a lot of detail. But the point I'm trying to make here is we see more and more customers using, uh, being affected by this because the way the managed Play Store works is a, a, a curator of a managed store for an organization would choose applications from the public Play Store and they would augment that with private applications which have been shared specifically with that organization. Now the complication comes in where those private applications at the time that I'm saying this are not subject to this restriction that they need to be targeting API level 28. I don't know if that's going to change in the future, I suspect that it will, but for now the latest I've heard is they're not subject to these restrictions, but any application developer I think should really be targeting like the latest SDK, if for no other reason then being in the public Play Store is a good idea because then it's your application is available to anyone's managed Play Store rather than a specific organization and you're not at these you know the whims of Google who decide all of a sudden hey now private applications do have to target the latest API level. Uh, so in conclusion on all of that, so we've got many new features that application developers can take advantage of in Android Pie. There have been some changes into what happens uh, when your application is running in the background. Pie has given the users more control, but it's done in a manageable way. Hey, here's the class I forgot the name of earlier on, the work manager class. So if you want to do any kind of work in the background that works well with all of Google's uh, restrictions and not just the restrictions in Pi, I'm talking about the Marshmallow, Nougat, Oreo uh, background restrictions which has been introduced over the years. Definitely recommend the Work Manager class, there's some great blogs on that. Uh, in fact I've got one on the on the next slide uh, that goes through exactly how you use it. It's very easy, I've, I've used it myself in a couple of sample projects and the end result of all of this is that we'll have extended battery life which is essential in any enterprise deployment. So finally uh, the resources in this presentation, uh, that documentation I talked about at the beginning where I just go over on the developer portal, what is new in Pi, that link is available there. The Google documentation, what's new in each release for the enterprise, Android Enterprise documentation from Google and that blog about Work Manager is, is down the bottom here. These are resources from Google. Uh, and so with that, are, are there any questions? I know, Stacey, you've been sort of amalgamating them in yeah. the background, hopefully. So yeah, thank you. We do, we have a, a few, and I'm gonna read through them here, hang on. Um, Matt asked, we find that end users can manually toggle battery saver mode on when they're prompted today in environments without device chargers, just the battery chargers. Um, we don't end up in a state where the device charging clears um, the battery saver mode, is there an, any ability coming to MX to disable the battery saver mode entirely so it that can never be enabled? Uh, we, are, we have discussed it, but I don't have anything I can commit to, but the, that, the feedback that that would be a good feature to have, I can take that away and I can feed that into the team. So yeah, I know we were discussing it internally, but let me take that comment away that it would be a good feature to have and I can I can certainly, it will add to the business case of, of doing this work. Okay, um, Matt also asks, Andrew Pye updates are publicly available listing support for the TC52 and TC20 class of devices, but there's nothing yet published for other Helios SM or SDM 660 devices like the NC93 and the TC8300. So this seems like an immediate departure from the marketing promises of a unified device platform. What explains the differences in release timing for Pi between those device models? Oh, you're, get, you're getting more into the, the business side that I don't feel too comfortable answering. But uh, honestly, we do have a single image for all of our devices. You You can't load one image from you can't like take a tc52 image and put it on a 93 technically because we don't let you do that but fundamentally the two are identical um 
the reason I can't talk to specifics because I don't know them honestly, but I strongly suspect the reason for those differences is the device team just want to do their testing of the Pi platform and the TC52 platform finish their testing before the TC83 or the uh, MC9300. Um, the for the WAN device, I think I said earlier that they do always have this delay where there needs to be some kind of carrier approval, so that's less surprising for me. But yeah, I was a little bit surprised that the the 83 and the 93 didn't have the updates, but I don't have the specific answer, sorry. Okay, um, the next question also from Matt, the new iPhones include a dedicated um, <clears throat> UWB chip that could have some interesting use cases around indoor positioning. Do the Helio devices support UWB today? I I don't know, I'm sorry, I'll be honest about that. Um, okay. I, yeah, we, I, I know like the, the WearNet solution from our location services, they're not, that's a different business unit. So they would work with iPhones as well as Android devices. But the, the actual question, I don't know the answer to. Sorry, whether we, we're planning to support that. Okay, I think yeah. that's it on questions. I'm just going to give everybody a moment here to gather their thoughts to see if there's anything else. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to wrap this up and thank Darren. Thank you. For this and awesome thank you presentation. Much. Really, really good information. Um, we'll post this as soon as we are able to on our YouTube channel uh, for Dev Talks, where you can review it. And then, of course, um, updates will be noted on our developer portal at developer.zebra.com. Any other closing thank thoughts, Darren? Uh, no, thank you very much, Stacey, and hopefully to see as, as many of you as I can at the upcoming Vegas App Forum, yeah, October 1st and 2nd, that. final plug. Yep, should be good. Hope to see you all there. Thanks so much and have an awesome day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.